Hello once again. Good morning to those on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those on the East Coast. Good evening to those further east of there. Welcome back to another Trino Community Broadcast. As always, my name is Cole Bowden. I'm joined by Mr. Manfred Moser. Manfred, <laughs> we've got a pretty exciting episode today talking about a very cool thing being at the Trino. Yeah, we got some hardcore geeks on board today. David Phillips and Matt Stevenson, both long, long-term developers with a lot of experience. Heads off to you both. Um, that are going to join us and talk about a pretty complicated topic that's very interesting and called open telemetry. Yeah, and there's a lot to go into that. I actually am uh, almost intentionally a little underinformed so I can represent an audience here and ask some questions. But before we get to that, we also have some other stuff to talk about, Manfred, including but not limited to Trina releases. Yeah, three weeks later from last episode, and we already have two more releases. That's pretty damn good. And there is some significant stuff in there. In fact, I think. Um, some would call this a major, major, major achievement, and we're probably going to blog about it more. It's been very much celebrated uh, already. That Snowflake connector that has been in the works for, I don't want to know exactly, but I'm like, say, want to say two years or something? It's at least a year and then some change for sure. So Yeah, and it has been an amazing collaboration between Eric uh, from Bloomberg and Tang from 4Pass and uh, Yuya and others from the Trino and Starburst team reviewing, getting it in and it finally landed. So I think that's going to be super useful to have as a migration tool, federation tool to query your Snowflake account and then move it into Iceberg or query it in parallel and whatever else. So super awesome feature. Yep. On top of that, we have some more run-of-the-mill changes. Uh, so support for subqueries inside unnest clauses, uh, row filtering and column masking when using open policy agent. And then improve latency when you have file system caching enabled. So caching was added very recently, still being improved and iterated on. So it's only going to get better. Um, it's a pretty big update worth doing. Uh, 441 has a pretty substantial change as well if you're using the Hive connector. Um, there was this legacy security mode on that connector, which is now gone. You can't use it anymore if you upgrade to 441. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, noting um, that one was the default and if you wanted to do things like dropping table, you had to have a bunch of properties set to true. All of those will now break your setup. So um, it's going to be allow all by default, which is really cool and makes a lot more sense. So uh, thanks for that cleanup, David, by the way. Uh, I think it's going to be really beneficial for the community once they migrate to it. But don't migrate just yet because especially if you're using Iceberg, there's a teeny regression. We're going to cut another release today. <laughs> yeah, so with, with Iceberg, there's going to be what was, what was the exact issue with it? Hold on. I'm going to go. Oh, it's just a regression with the connector. Uh, file statistics domain uh, are having issues. So Yeah, and it's only hit for 40. So if you haven't upgraded yet beyond 430 something, just wait another day and then go to 442. But yeah, super awesome. I also wanted to mention that the open policy agent is kind of cool because it just landed like two releases ago as a new feature. And now we already have like additional features again. So that's really nice. Great, great progress. And now we're going to introduce our guests. Matt and, oops, and oh, David. David and Matt in this order instead. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Matt and David. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? We'll start yeah. with Matt. He's on the left. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I can I see the which one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, my name is Matt Stevenson. Uh, I work at Starburst Data, where I am a, a software engineer there. I also had a lot of the infrastructure initiatives. So, um, you know, observability has been kind of like a major focus of mine at Starburst. Uh, Outside of that, like uh, for fun, I, I go and build the man for Burning Man. Uh, that behind me, and uh, I fly planes. <laughs> cool. So, so you you flew out of the mud that was this year? I, I did actually. I, uh, <laughs> nice work. Directly from Burning Man to a set of meetings in uh, San Jose with uh, with a lot of uh, other Star Wars folks. <laughs> I flew actually one of our another one of our employees off of the as well. <laughs> nice work. Well, let's hope it's like less 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 muddy next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. What about you? Everyone knows you already, but just like quick recap. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Dave Phillips. I'm one of the uh, co-creators of Trino. Been working on Trino since uh, 2012. So, yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a long ride. We've done a lot of interesting stuff, and uh, it's uh, amazing that the project has grown so much, and we have such a huge community. Yeah, and talking about huge community and news, you are now also being appointed as the dedicated file system lead. What does that mean, David? Yeah, so uh, in the beginning, we had we had the Hive connector. Um, it connected to uh, Hadoop HDFS. It used the Hadoop file system APIs. It used like all the Hive code to read different file formats. Uh, we ended up um, writing a uh, S3 implementation on top of the uh, Hadoop file system APIs. Later added like implementations for uh, like GCS and Azure um, using the official uh, Hadoop file system libraries for those. And uh, like then we later added Iceberg, uh, Delta Lake, and Hoodie, and all of those also used to do file system APIs. So we had like all this code in Trino for all the different uh, object storage systems using uh, the Hadoop APIs, and those were pretty terrible because um, <laughs> they were like built. You know, they were built like 20 years ago. They were designed for HDFS, so they didn't really work well with uh, how like object storage systems work. Um, they've all like the API surface is huge. You don't really know what things are like, what methods are going to work or exactly how they're going to be implemented in the different file system implementations. So um, a couple of years ago, we started a project to rip out the Duke file system APIs and create new file system APIs in Trino with like new native implementations and then re-implement all the file system readers and all the connector code on top of those. And so uh, we finally got that project done. Now you can run Trino um, without any Hadoop code. Hadoop is actually only loaded uh, if you if you ask for it as a as a config. Um, but otherwise, like you don't have Hadoop on the class path at all. And, and the so, developers get a clean API to work with that you designed, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so the problem is that uh, we need to enforce um, like this vision of having like very clean, focused APIs that are implementable on uh, all of the like on all the different object storage systems. And so we don't want um, we don't want to just have lots of random stuff added to the API because like that that's the easy thing to do is you're like oh I need to solve this problem like let me just go add like one new method to the file systems like for this one thing I'm doing like we want to make sure that like they're clean and they're focused and they work well across everything and so like my job as the file system lead is to uh, ensure that happens. So that that like any deep like implementation details from like underlying file systems, like, I don't know, Hadoop or like, I don't know, like even Delta Lake or Hudio or Iceberg doesn't bubble up and has a custom switch or something like that, right? Uh, exactly. Um, like a, a good example of this recently is um, in the old, in the old uh, S3 implementation for Hive, like we had a feature for skipping files in Amazon Glacier. And I was like, okay, well, how do we do this? Because it's kind of like one of those, there's lots, it's, it's a feature that breaks the abstractions. And so I had to think about like, how can we add this to the file system APIs in a clean way that lets us implement this feature for users, but doesn't like add this very, very specific API in there that's only for like S3. And that's only for the Hive connector as well. Cool. And now users can use that already, right? Like we updated the docs a bit together and people can use the new file system APIs indirectly by using those new native file systems, right? Yeah, that's right. And we're working on making those uh, the default as well and have and continuing to improve the documentation on there. So thanks, Manfred. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> thanks, man. All right, cool. And then also exciting news. Um, it is now only five days away that Java 22 is landing. And what are we doing with that? Yeah, so we're uh, switching to Java 22 as soon as possible. Like there's lots of... Uh, nice new features and APIs and also some uh, preview APIs in Java 22 that we want to use. And so we want to get Trino on a cadence where we can be upgrading to the latest Java basically as soon as it comes out. Because Java Java is on a six month release train, like Java 22 comes out in March, 23 comes out six months and next uh, September, October and like so on. And so every six months they're adding lots of new stuff to Java and we want to always be able to take advantage of those features. Yeah, especially also for Project Hummingbird, right? Like there's some really interesting things. And even like in the last couple of updates, like we went to Java 21, like multi-line strings and things that are like really simple make a huge impact on making the, the code base cleaner and easier to read. So 
it's really awesome and of course hopefully we get some more contributors that are interested in playing with java 22 on a on a on a like full-on big software not just some to some toy implementation though that's really cool yeah, with, with java 8 still in so many places being on java 22 means you get a lot of modern features i mean this is relative to 21 where we are right now but it's it's still like night and day between like java 8 where you're you still don't even have lambdas and and where we are now so yeah, call out by the way. My son is at UBC now, and they're still like on Java 11 or something like that. I'm like, let's get on with this over there on the universities too. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, so that's super exciting. Another thing that's also been really cool is that Yuya has been working really hard and has managed to convince a couple of friends of his in Japan and a publisher to get this happening. Look how cool this looks. Trino the definitive guy in Japanese. So that is available for everyone now. So now we have a Chinese, a Polish, an English, and a, and a Japanese version. So really, thank you for all that work, Yuya. Hopefully, the community in Japan can appreciate and find this useful. And obviously, we also have a Slack channel for native speakers that um, allows them to communicate uh, on an easier level, right? Like English isn't my first language either, so. <laughs> I don't necessarily hang out often on a German <laughs> channel, but like I, I, I totally understand how sometimes things are just easier in your native language. And that's a, that's a good thing. And then last but not least, we have a Trino contributor call scheduled again for the 21st of March. So please reach out or take the invite. We are gonna talk about the test guide, Java 22 and other things. Anything that anyone wants to talk about in terms of their PRs or work and having uh, to really technical questions um on that call on the 21st of march and now matt is going to tell us what open telemetry even is yeah uh so open telemetry is a uh open source project that kind of spawned out of uh it's kind of like a long lineage of, of projects that uh eventually converged into open telemetry you've got um open tracing you have zipkin kind of in the early days um those are kind of like your tracing components um like some of the big which is a lot of like the the big uh i think improvement to trino that's that's the, one of the most recent big improvement to observability in trino um and then you have open metrics which is a spec that kind of evolved out of prometheus and that spec uh got absorbed into the open census project and then that kind of got pulled together into uh open telemetry um and then there's also kind of like a, a, an events and logging component to open telemetry as well. Uh, so it, as a whole, the project encompasses like a standard for um, traces, uh, metrics, and logging. Um, and it kind of, you know, has like the various, uh, it has support for all three of those. I think over time, we're looking at trying to make sure that we uh, support all of those. But I, at, the, at this moment, uh, the big news, the big thing is like, you know, getting traces, uh, up telemetry traces. Uh, right. I have to ask a super dumb question. What is a trace even? And what the hell is it used for? <laughs> so a uh, trace is um, simply just like uh, a collection of metadata um, and associated with like a temporal record that gives you like um, the time uh, that it takes for a certain thing to occur within code, right? Um, it has a start and end time or start and a duration. Uh, it has a series of metadata attached to it uh, and there's a hierarchy or a linkage between uh traces and spans so that you can kind of see um you know various uh various inner workings of your code um and how long those things take take to so, so what's a span then uh a span is you can kind of um <laughs> i'm gonna get this messed up uh but a trace is kind of like the 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 higher level concept and a span is kind of like a little bit of uh that uh duration inside of a trace okay and and where we, okay that's cool so it's kind of like a fancy log that yeah. like gets spit out into the ether and then yeah. and telemetry is like a standard for that yes it's a standard for defining uh the it's the api for actually creating traces and spans and then also the standard for uh transporting those traces and spans over the wire using grpc Cool. There's a front end engineer who's familiar with HTML saying, I know what a span is right now. Yeah. <laughs> Different span. 
Yeah, it also encapsulates something, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, we're using it to mean a similar but very different thing. So, so where did this? Like, why did we think this is a good idea to add to Trino? Um, I'll, technically, David added it to Trino, so I'll, I'll let him uh, in his wisdom. Uh, but I think that um, you know, I think they're great. Yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, it was actually, it was thanks to Matt. So uh, Matt had set up a uh, Datadog at uh, Starburst for some internal stuff. And like Datadog was one of those products, like I'd never used an observability product like that before. And like, once I saw it, I was like, well, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> this you, is the ball. Of, <laughs> it's one of those classes of the tools that once you see it, like you just have to use it everywhere. And so uh, like open telemetry, um, it, it was finally like a good API that we could put into Trino. Like we kind of been talked about doing tracing for years, but it was never clear like what API or how should we integrate in the code. And it was finally like open telemetry just seemed to be in a state where like, yeah, we can just integrate this and, it, and it'll it'll be fine. We don't need to worry about all the different things you had to worry about with like previous generations of libraries. Open telemetry is like pretty standard, right? Widely used. It's from the Cloud Native Compute Foundation as well, isn't it? So there's a lot of like supporting software, like you mentioned, Datadog supports it. I think there's one called Yego or whatever. That's like a bit of a UI. There's probably others as well, I'm guessing, but I, I don't know, honestly. Yeah, it's pretty ubiquitous in the industry. Like majority of like uh, observability providers allow you to, you know, push to almost directly to their uh, to their endpoints. That early vend specialized collectors that take care of authentication, you know, things like that that you can run right next to Trino. Um, that's kind of how we do it at, at, uh, at Starburst. So, yeah, so, so yeah. why is tracing useful in Trino? Like Trino is a distributed system. You run a query, it's gonna run on multiple machines. It's gonna go talk to various backends. Like it might talk to like S3, it talks to a Hive Metastore or AWS Glue, or it talks to Azure, it, you know, it's, it's um, or different connectors talk to like different backends and so, you want to know when you're running a query like why is this query slow or like where are the slow parts or like just general performance metrics like what happened where when i was running this and so tracing lets you instrument all the code and see exactly like okay how long did i spend planning the query how long did i spend in each optimizer how long did i spend making various metadata calls how long did i spend reading data from s3 right like and you just get to see like a waterfall of like all those things throughout the entire query so it's like a project plan, but actually what happened. Exactly. So, and it can be very detailed. Like you can see like just high level stuff. You can also see like very detailed down to like individual calls to S3. So, and so, so with this knowledge, we can do what? Optimize better, upgrade the hardware that's the bottleneck? All of the above? Yeah, all of the above. Like it really, just, it gives you information about like what's going on when you run this query. Cause before you yeah. just kind of look at it and you just kind of have to guess or you'd have to have like, look at various metrics and like different places and like tracing just gives you like, just tells you exactly what's going on. So it, and it's also turned out to be useful in, uh, um, in development as well. Like we had a um, thing, we had a test that would want to test um, performance characteristics of the code. like. Okay, when we do this operation, how many backend Metastore calls do we make? Like exactly which Metastore calls? Because it's very easy to introduce things where maybe you accidentally call it in a loop or you just you have some extra calls in there and those can be uh, a performance hit. And so we'd have these like special wrappers that would be kind of like tracing where they'd instrument like, this is how many calls we made to this method. This is how many calls we made to this method. And we have all these assertions in the code to verify it. But when you get to do that for like for everything, it's just it's it's kind of a mess and it's kind of wasted work because it's only for testing. And now with tracing, we can just rip all that out and we can actually use the same tracing code that we use in production and just verify those performance characteristics and tests. So both like you get rid of code and you know that you're actually using the same tracing code and that you're using in production. So you you know that the tracing code works correctly. Cool. So so like when you decided to pull this into Trino, um 
like obviously you pulled in the dependency or whatever that that makes the format and then and then how did you decide how to sprinkle it across the code base like i mean twin is huge and there's lots of moving parts like are you just like oh yeah a little bit of planner here a little bit of optimizer there and these connectors a little bit of sugar like like how do you have like where is that at and what, what did you decide is important to emit these traces yeah so part of it was just judgment just having an idea of like okay these things seem interesting so you have a like Matt said like you have a trace and a trace like we'll start there'll be one trace for the entire query so the entire query like everything inside the query goes into a single trace and then you have spans that break down the different operations so like it's kind of obvious like, okay we're going to have like one span for planning one span for generating splits we'll have spans for execution right and those are pretty high level mm -hmm. and then inside of that you're like okay well we're doing some planning like what's interesting in planning or like what do i think might take more time so then you just add like another level of tracing inside that span and then you have that span if like it, so if you kind of look at a span and like it's it, that span takes a long time or like you kind of like when you're looking at it, you're like okay well this took 20 milliseconds here what might have happened inside of there right like i don't know because i don't have any more detailed information then you break that down and you add some more spans inside of it and you just kind of like keep going until the spans get so granular that they're not interesting or that there's just too many of them to look at. So like we like, I, I wrote the documentation for this and like you have to enable man, enable it. So if I add this quickly to, uh, for people that want to play with it, you just configure tracing is true. Is at the end point where it goes? And if people want to play with it, they can use this example and follow through with Docker. But my question is, so how do you decide when to enable it? Like, is there like, what's the overhead or like, like, isn't it going to be like throwing stuff out like crazy everywhere to like produce a lot of traffic? Is that like, how, how bad is it? So to speak, right. You know, it's a bit like logging, right? Like don't switch off debug, switch on debug logging for everything because it's going to like spill over in your logs like crazy. Is that a consideration for tracing or not so much? Or... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So like, this is an area that probably needs more work on our side and it also kind of depends on your environment so uh like right now we only have a way to turn on tracing in trino um at, globally at the server level um and there's no way to like turn it on or off at runtime so if you turn it on you're kind of you're getting the fire hose of like just everything going to your observability endpoint and so potentially you could do sampling at the observability like at the system that's ingesting the events um you can also so we support, there's a standard way to propagate a trace from a client to a server. So the Trino client support, or the Trino like, this Trino server endpoint for clients, it supports um, this trace propagation. And there's actually like a standard header that you could use to turn off tracing. And so potentially, like, depending on how you're submitting queries, you could turn them on or off on a, on a query basis. Oh, like is that through a JDBC driver or the CLI or both, or like just part of the the, the power payload basically? Uh, yes. Well, ostensibly, it, it's not actually not implemented yet in those, but um, okay. it it could be. Cool. Um, by the way, shout out to Jan who chimed in. He mentioned that the Open Telemetry web page has a, a good page about concepts, and yes, that's what I used as a motivation to query <laughs> Matt because <laughs> I didn't know all these things. But you tell it, I benefited from that page very well. Um, and yeah, I will, I'll be linking it into the show notes. And then other question also that Jan mentioned is it might be worth talking about which clients propagate traces. And I think when he means clients, he talks about like the JDBC driver, the CLI, or whatever comes in. But I think it's kind of also interesting on the other side, right? Like you mentioned S3, but like, what about like something going down to like, I don't know, via the JDBC driver to Postgres, like can Postgres emit these kind of traces as well? Or like, yeah, um, I think that, uh, I don't know if we propagate through the connectors all the time, but uh, you can definitely, there's a standard for propagating traces over the wire that uh, we actually leverage at servers to be able to propagate traces in and out of Trinos that we're running in our SaaS product. Um, and we have a test environment uh, that can actually propagate those traces starting all the way from the JDBC client or, or from the Python client, I think actually. So. Cool. so that's something we're looking at adding more like in the different connectors or something like that potentially if there's interest. Yeah, I would say so. 
I don't yeah, know. It's, it, this is a good area for community contributions. Like yeah. when I worked on it, I kind of instrumented the core of Trino and the parts that I thought were interesting. And then I, I instrumented like S3 and like, I think the Hive Meta Store and like a few places like that, that like, it's more like kind of just showing how it's done in like part like in places that I personally found interesting, but there's um, lots of like, lots of connectors to be done. Like you said, like the Postgres connector, we don't have it. So like if you're using the Postgres connector and like you want tracing, like that'd be a great thing to contribute. So how hard is it to do that? Like, like, is it like a hundred lines of code, 12 lines of code or one line of code like to, to switch it on, so to speak? Like, it, it kind of depends on if the client that you're using, like has tracing support, like open telemetry built in, or if there's a, uh, like there's an open, open telemetry integration you can plug in. Like, for example, adding it to S3 was, uh, I don't know, maybe like 10 lines of code in the right place to uh, like hook into their stuff and like add the open telemetry uh, tracing because the, the S3 client already supports that. Um, the same is true for like Azure and GCS, like they already support tracing. So it was like pretty easy to hook it in. Like if the so, if you want are, so it's more like just researching how do I, how do I enable tracing for like this system that I'm talking to using the Java client or using the Trino. So with Postgres, if we talk about that as an example, you would have to look if the PostgreSQL JDBC driver supports it and how you pass that trace in, and then it would have to deal with the rest of the chain, basically. Exactly. And there might be other places like in Trino code itself that we want to add tracing for. And uh, like that is just ends up being usually a few lines of code in each place. Often like it can end up being a whole lot of boilerplate because like you want to pass different attributes. Like for example, the connector metadata APIs, the tracing is probably, I don't know, it's like several hundred lines long at least. Because like we want to instrument, like if you're making a metadata call to like fetch information about this table, we'll pass in like the catalog schema and table name, right? So like with the trace and like for every single call we're passing in lots of attributes about exactly what you're doing so that the traces are pretty detailed and you can kind of see exactly what was going on. And so that can end up being like pretty verbose, but like it's very straightforward. It's just a lot of code. Cool. Well, hopefully the, the listeners and the community can send some PRs to make that even more powerful. And then uh, we can have some more successes in, in from like practical experience. Maybe, maybe tell us a bit what you've been using this for. Like where has it been useful? Like are there some ticks and tricks or can you show us something? How's it been working? I mean, you talked about local development, but you also mentioned production. Like, how's that going? Oh. Matt, you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, we actually use it pretty extensively at Starburst for um, across the entire platform, but definitely to be able to figure out what's going on like within Trino and how it's interacting with our systems uh, in the SaaS product uh, space. So um, I actually have like, I can kind of show off a little bit of one of our dark traces if, if, if you want, which might be helpful to kind of Yeah, that'd be super interesting. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, go, go ahead. All right, so um, so this is kind of like a pretty involved trace. Uh, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to find one that starts all the way from the client. Um, Jan probably could. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, um, you know, it's kind of going through several of our internal systems. Um, as you can see- What are we looking here at? Like, what is that UI? This is uh, Datadog. This is their tracing uh, UI. So a lot of different, like this, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of different vendors out there in the observability space. Uh, we chose Datadog at Starburst, but um, I think there's other, you know, you can get, you can definitely get similar uh, interfaces to work in like other other vendors. Um, <clears throat> and you can get this kind of look and feel as well within the open source community with Jaeger. Uh, but uh, just kind of zooming in a little bit here, you can kind of see uh, this is only like 1.6 seconds, but you can see we're going through like several internal services here, um, going through kind of like our security layer. We we're just talking about um, uh, Postgres, and actually, you do we do have like uh, the Postgres driver does support uh, open telemetry out of the box, so it's probably not a big lift for the community. Here you can see these green spans are actually Trino itself, so we kind of go from our internal. Uh, infrastructure over to uh, over to. Trino. I'm sorry. Why why would why did you mention Postgres now? Oh, we were just chatting about the Postgres driver. Right? I know, but like, why is Postgres there? Uh, that's actually our internal uh, database that we have uh, 
for our SaaS product. So it's not Trino calling Postgres, but this is actually our internal services that Trino uh, interfaces with in our SaaS platform that then persist data within uh, Postgres. So like some configuration in Starburst Galaxy that like what client you are and like whatever, what clusters you have, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Or like how like users and roles, things like that. Um, so, uh, and you, as you can see, like, as David was saying, you can get incredibly detailed here. So you can see we've got, uh, individual tasks. We've got, um, oh gosh, it's UI gets a little ornery when you've got this many traces, but you can see, um, that you've got tasks broken out. You've got a remote task. So, uh, this is all like doing, um, RPC. This is, uh, sorry, doing rest calls between, uh, I think this is actually all within a single coordinator on this, but uh, this is all running on a single node Trino installation, but you would be able to see like through this, if I, if I pulled up the right trace, you could see where we're, uh, where Trino is calling back to itself. And of course you get a whole bunch of metadata on all of these traces. So you can see like for a given task, you can see like all sorts of very detailed um, uh, metadata that gives you like the, you know, like we actually have a whole bunch of additional um, orchestration uh, or additional instrumentation um, within uh, the open telemetry collector that adds a bunch of like additional metadata onto these traces so that we know like where this is coming from, what pod it's coming from, what uh, Kubernetes cluster, where where in the world it's running. Um, so there's a whole lot that comes out of this uh, that's incredibly valuable. Uh, if uh, this is actually just doesn't have any errors on it, but um, in the UI, you'll actually see if there's like an exception that's thrown within the context of a span, that exception will show up as well within the, uh, within the, within the span. Um, and if you propagate exceptions, they'll kind of show up in every span that they've propagated through. So and it's all green because it's all on one coordinator Trino, basically. But if there's like multiple, yeah. would they show up in different colors? So you would know like this node does that, that kind of stuff? Uh, it's possible to do that. Uh, the way that we have things kind of like organized, we kind of have Trino, all of the Trino, all of the Trino traces are kind of like organized under a single uh, category. So they would all show up as green. All of the other, everything else you see is, um, uh, other traces within our infrastructure um, or other spans within our infrastructure. So, um, you know, this is like kind of the front door. We've got security checks. We've got additional security checks here. Um, this is all like Trino internal running the query itself. So like when all these lines are like on top of each other stacked, like where, they are, like where all the green stuff is on the right there, that means they are doing, it's doing all these things in parallel, right? Correct. So this is like, uh, over time. So this is time domain right here. So it's like, you've got, um, you know, the request comes in the front door and then it kind of kicks off inside of Trino. Of course, like right after Trino accepts the query, we come back and respond back and say like, Oh, go to this to get the result, go here to get the results. But just, you like, so at this point, this is where like, are you, this is the actual endpoint that, uh, a Starburst customer would hit to try to uh, run a query. And when this returns back, they're getting a reference to go back and get results later. So this is um, at the end of this V1 statement, you've already gotten, you made one put request down to Trino, but the query is going to run asynchronously after that, right? It's going to continue running. Um, and then later on, there's another trace that you could go find that would have the, uh, you know, the actual retrieval of results. So question, how much a performance hit does adding all of this tracing do? Like, are we adding milliseconds or less than that or more than that? Like, how much are we paying to have all of this insight if we're enabling this on a cluster? I mean, on the Galaxy, uh, like the overall, like, it doesn't have much of an impact on... Uh, on any of the Trinos, it doesn't appear to have any impact on Trino running inside of Starburst. And uh, I believe that a part of that is because we're very careful about where we run the open telemetry collectors and how reliable we make sure that is. Because uh, when a span closes, the span processor will immediately make a gRPC call to uh, an open telemetry collector. And I, if, if that infrastructure is unreliable, 
um, or overloaded, then you can have those API calls kind of like take longer and eat up uh, threads and eat up time on the machine doing retries. <clears throat> So network wise that that collector has to be close and like really good performance basically and not like so yeah we run like high availability multiple collectors and they're all within the same we run kind of a hierarchy of collectors so that you know the traces get off of uh the traces can be pushed to a collector very quickly the spans can be pushed to a collector very quickly cool and David, you mentioned before that it can be enabled sort of like via like a not yet exposed kind of hack <laughs> from the client. So are they, is it always enabled on the clusters or is it basically by default now disabled and then you switch it on when you're like, oh, this is something going wrong. We need to look. Uh, yeah. So if you turn on tracing in Trino, you set the trace enabled equals true. It's always enabled. And then you could disable it on a per trace or like a per query request by setting the appropriate like trace state header when you um submit the submit the query from the client yeah but as to the overhead like it's going to be a slight amount of cpu like i'm sure it's like less than one percent like it's uh very minor and most of the places where we add tracing are things that are calling out to an external system so like if you're going to go make an http request to like like s3 or some you know you're, you're going to like call Postgres or something, right? Like those network, like the overhead of doing a network request is like right. very high relative to like the minor amount of overhead you're adding for tracing. Okay, cool. Like we don't add tracing. Like if you add it, if, if you're doing so much tracing that tracing was using noticeable resources, like you would be tracing way too much. Mm -hmm. like, and you, you would have just way too many traces as well. So, so, so maybe we need to dedicate you as the tracing placement lead as well. So <laughs> when we send pull requests in, people don't just sprinkle the traces everywhere. <laughs> it's about the being deliberate rather than just, you Sorry. know, you don't want to be the the undergrad engineer who's debugging by adding print statements every third line. <laughs> yeah, tracing is about um, usually like figuring out what's going on in different components often in like distributed components. Like it's yeah. not about like tracing is not like CPU profiling or sampling. Like there's other tools for that, like JFR. Tracing is more about telling you like, I ran a query, it did all this stuff across all these machines and all these backend services, like what happened? So, so when you come to measurements, um, Matt, you also mentioned that there's also open metrics involved and you like, added that as well to Trino. So but how is that different from or like related to open telemetry? Yeah, so open metrics is kind of a protocol on top of like, uh, you know, a library that's existed inside of Trino and Airlift for a long time, which is uh, JMX utils, uh, which Martin wrote. And um, what open metrics does is it provides like kind of uh, first class support to Trino to expose the, um, uh, the open metric standard endpoint which is similar to what you would find, like um, if you were to add like the Prometheus client libraries per se to like your your code, like start exposing metrics to a Prometheus um, collect, like to a Prometheus uh, collector. So um, you can, I think uh, there's you could today you could tie. There's no need to enable anything. You can just go on ahead and tie a um, uh, Prometheus directly into uh, Trino. Um, and if you were to just like go run the development server on your own or run Trino on your own, and you go curl the slash metrics endpoint, you can see the uh, open metrics results. Uh, it's kind of what it ultimately does is it makes things a lot simpler than having to run the um, uh, Prometheus JMX uh, sidecar. Like if you're running this in Kubernetes or in Docker, the uh, that we found that that actually like introduces at times a decent amount of overhead. You're basically having to use like um, like it under the covers uses like RMI to to talk over the wire, which is like not really between containers, which is not really great. So this you know really just kind of simplifies that, saves a lot of memory, saves a lot of uh, you know RPC calls. Whenever it makes it so that you're just doing the fetch directly to Trino instead of to some 
additional process, which is then doing another RPC neutrino. So, um, <clears throat> and it will hopefully like over time, we'll be able to make sure that we standardize the metric naming because kind of like one of the problems with uh, running that Prometheus sidecar is that it depends on how you configure it, what the metric naming kind of comes out, with, right? So um, if two people have that running in different with different Trino uh, installations, you could end up with different metrics and then you can't really share dashboards or other um, other artifacts like that, alerts, things like that. So um, yeah, we did that at, uh, we, I built that mostly to like make it really seamless for us to integrate Trino with the rest of the observability stack at uh, Starburst, um, but made sure that it was like part of the community. It's actually a part of Airlift. So if you build your job application on top of the Airlift framework, you'll get that basically for free. Um, uh, uh, the tracing is also built directly into Airlift. So if you were to just go write your job app in Airlift, you get that for free. We still have to do that on a Trino gateway. <laughs> Just yeah. change it over. Then we get all that stuff for free. <laughs> yeah, that's like drop wizard based. It's I drop think. wizard at the moment. Yeah. It's like Which... legacy, sort of like from ages ago. We want to move over, but we have to figure out how to do that first. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, in my past uh, when I was working on uh, Oracle Cloud, uh, Oracle, we used drop wizard as kind of our standard application container, and we had to bolt the like. Prometheus, um, the Prometheus sidecar onto every single app that was running, um, every single service that was running. And like, if you summed up the memory of all those sidecars across the entire cloud, it was like, it, it got into the, it could get into the terabytes. It was tons of those little tiny services everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, you can just go, I guess you, as an organization, could pay a bunch of money to run that extra sidecar <laughs> for all that memory. Or you could just, you know, call it directly now. In Trino, um, you can configure. There's a little bit of configuration that you can do with the uh, Open Metrics endpoint to expose metrics that aren't necessarily known to JMX Utils. So JMX Utils is kind of like if you're looking in the code, it's that app managed annotation that um, is kind of in a lot of places. Uh, so you can, if you, there is a possibility that there's uh, metrics in JMX that are not necessarily exposed or um, uh, aware, like. JMX Utils is not aware of those metrics. And so those you can actually get at with um, with some custom config that allows you to specify specific JMX object names that um, and object name patterns that will expose those additional metrics on the uh, on the slash metrics endpoint. It also helps with like certain connectors being able to get metrics out of those. So open like if I if I'm correct, like can I correct this some like explain that then? Prometheus is kind of like the standard application for the metrics and open metrics came out of it as a standard. And now it's kind of like a really good tool to look at those endpoints. Is that how it works kind of? Yeah, I think that's really close. I would say that Prometheus is kind of the original open source project that a lot of this technology came about uh, for open metrics and like really spurred that standard along. Open metrics itself looks pretty close. It's not identical to the uh, Prometheus standard. But uh, Prometheus is interoperable with Open Metrics, um, and Open Metrics is kind of like trying to get to a more open standard uh, that's not necessarily a part of the uh, Prometheus Open Source project itself. So, mm -hmm. a whole lot of different uh, observability platforms support Open Metrics. You can use like the Datadog cluster agent to scrape them. Uh, you can use uh, Chronosphere supports um, supports it. There's a whole lot of different. Um, uh, vendors out there that support open metrics as a kind of a standard protocol. And it's it, kind of oh, funny because we now have sort of two sort of like infinite loops in a way, like you can expose metrics in Trino, pump them into Prometheus, and then you can use the Prometheus Trino <laughs> collector to query those metrics with Trino and SQL. Yep. <laughs> and you can do the same with the GMX stuff. We can also yeah. use the GMX connector to use SQL to create that stuff. So Trino is kind of the the UI for, for interrogating that stuff as well. But Manfred, what if we traced the queries where we're querying Prometheus and then queried Prometheus to check our tracing of it? <laughs> it's a loop. It's like you turtle can, You can go full uh, Ouroboros. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very interesting. So 
Um, and yes, I will add the documentation for the stuff. I, I will extract even more knowledge out of Matt and put that together. There is no documentation for the metrics input just yet, but it is coming. Yeah, and if, uh, at Starburst, we're actually exposing some a, a subset of those metrics for the trainer clusters. So it's uh, it's something where like uh, <clears throat> you can actually just run your own Prometheus and scrape your cluster that we're running for you, your trainer cluster that the Starburst Galaxy is running for you. So Matt, a question that I've had is why open metrics versus open telemetry metrics? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, and like I have strong opinions about the pull versus push metrics, which is kind of the biggest uh, reason to go for open metrics versus uh, versus open telemetry. Open telemetry's metrics implementation is really powerful in terms of like, so its protocol is gRPC. It does a push of metrics. Um, data across the wire. So uh, from the perspective of like a running application, if you were to utilize uh, the open telemetry metrics uh, protocol, it would push gRPC messages to a collector and then that collector would push those metrics say to another observability platform or to a, a metric store. Um, the, the, uh, the benefit of open metrics is that you don't necessarily have to rely on the application itself to push those metrics, um, you can. Um, you, it's a pull metric, a pull protocol. So you can still utilize the open telemetry, telemetry collector and configure it for open metrics instead of. Uh, it'll always listen for open telemetry metrics, but uh, you can configure it to scrape a metrics endpoint on a service, which then uh, puts the ownership of ensuring that a regular timely update of that telemetry data happens from the collector itself, which is like a much easier thing to monitor and track than having to make sure all of your application code everywhere is running and not necessarily blocked on some other thread or running out of CPU and unable to actually do that RPC call for uh, the metrics time series. So um, you can regularly uh, pull It'll regularly pull that slash metrics endpoint and and collect all of those uh, that time series data. There's some interest, I think, that uh, to utilize like um, to make sure that that's always like a high uh, priority endpoint. Like with uh, I've had some conversations with folks about using like Jetty QoS to to make sure that it's like always available kind of thing. Um, but I think that like there's there's probably some more uh, chatting we should do before we do that in Trino, but <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely look at that for internal services at Starburst where we, you know, we, we push a lot of our metal to the limit. So um, it's, you know, sometime if we were to use open telemetry metrics, we'd probably drop some metrics here and there, which isn't great because that's like dropping those metrics. The metrics that you get when your system's overloaded is some of the most valuable metrics you'll ever get out of that service, right? You'll understand like how it fails and uh, like how to alert yourself when it's about to fail. And if you don't have that data, that, that and you just like your system just keels over and it's like, oh, I don't have any time series. Like it's hard to figure out if you're going to keel over again. You don't really know why I did it to begin with. So <laughs> yeah, you set yourself up for failure when it matters the most. <laughs> That's not exactly. good. <laughs> exactly, it fails at the worst possible time. Right. Right. That's super interesting. So we'll put a, put together a demo for for Prometheus and Trino as well in the documentation for Open Metrics. I hope so. <laughs> I have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> that should be good. Very very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, anything else we want to talk about? Yeah, um, I can. Uh, there's one more observability component that uh, we ended up adding to Airlift and Trino uh, through Starburst. That's kind of handy that um, we use, which is for all the logging. Um, in which we uh, now have, well, Airlift has supported for a little while like JSON logging, but there's like uh, these changes allow you to do um, JSON formatted logs, which makes it a lot easier for like uh, Fluent D or Fluent Bit to scrape those logs. Um, the uh, It's a pretty simple configuration uh, change. And then uh, we, I, I added support for being able to open a TCP socket and stream logs instead of putting them on the file system, which allows you to run uh, Fluent Bit or Fluent D as a sidecar um, and stream over a TCP socket all of your logs instead of having them hit the file system 
first, which is just a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, that's better for using it in Kubernetes and stuff, right? So yeah, exactly. I think well, long term we'll look at like maybe being able to support the uh, events protocol, open telemetry events protocol there. I think. Crazy, huh, David? Matt always has plans for more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how the software always gets better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool, Cole, anything else you need to understand better? Because I I'm like overloaded. My head is like smoking at this stage. <laughs> yeah. I think uh it's it's fascinating and there there's always more work to be done and more to learn, right? That's kind of the beauty of, of these systems. Um so if people wanted to read more, of course you can go to the open telemetry website, Trino documentation lab references. Is there anything else, Matt, that you think you'd advise people to go look at if they want to fully understand the weeds of this? Uh, yeah, the open telemetry website is an excellent starting point. I think that there's a open metrics as a standard. Uh, it's like a, you know, a, a, a standard out there for that, which is, that's a little nitty gritty. I don't know if you necessarily need to read that, but um, I would encourage once once every, all the examples and stuff are up, playing with them, like run Prometheus. You can run Prometheus right now and go, um, go scrape your Trino. There's a little bit of work you have to do in the, Prometheus config to set the right headers um, is the only kind of gotcha there. Uh, the on the logging side, I would say take a look at Fluent Bit and the TCP socket um, input. Uh, it's a little bit more. It's a much more efficient and easy way to do uh, logging. Uh, of course, I wouldn't necessarily suggest you know using TCP socket logging over uh, any kind of network uh, outside of like the host itself. Like you should generally run it as a sidecar, otherwise you're kind of transmitting those logs over plain text over a network. You better be a secure network. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the most secure, yeah. It's... <laughs> There's awesome. no bad actors, nothing I to worry about. I promise I'll work with Matt to get all of this stuff into the docs as well on the Trina side. Open telemetry is already there, as you see, and the other stuff will follow. Yeah, I, I apologize. I kind of laid it laid, laid it all on you really quick there. Yeah, for, no, no, it's all good. It's good. We got to we got to get it in underneath an hour for the Trina community <laughs> broadcast. So it's the density, information density has to be up there. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I think we can round the show out today. What do you think, Joel? Yeah, thank you very much to Matt and David. That was super informative and interesting. Um, I now know about a thousand times more about this than I did prior to the start of this episode, which is usually the way you want things to go. So I'm thankful for that. And uh, we do both have a good one. As well, yeah. thank you. Thanks for having us. Always. So what else do we have to talk about quickly, Cole, before we- got we... Trino Fest coming up, Manfred. Yeah, and on the day after, we're going to do a Trino Contributor Congregation as well. It's going to be amazing to meet more geeks like Matt and David and talk talk shop uh, about what's going on in the Trino development and the Trino community world. So obviously we'll have lots of sessions at Trino Fest as well, but we're still looking for more speakers, right? Yes. So if you want to attend, come attend. You can do it live in Boston or virtually. So make sure to register either way. Um, we've got some talks lined up now that are pretty good, but we need more. So if you have built anything cool with Trino, deployed anything cool with Trino, have a story to tell, have a performance improvement to brag about, just some insights or analysis on what makes Trino tick, sign up, submit a talk. We can work with you and we can make sure that you can get that talk going. It's a great way to build up your resume, professionally network, just brag. I mean, bragging is fun, right? Like if you did something cool, you may as well talk about it um, in a way that benefits the broader community. So it's, it's, benevolent as much as it is kind of getting to flex that you're smart. So we love talks uh, and we need more. So make sure you check out the Trino Fest website, submit those. And then also, if you want to talk to the maintainers and developers working on Trino, that next day we have the Trino Contributor Congregation. Um, so in Boston, you can do a two for one, kill two birds with one stone with a trip to that city and uh, meet everyone that was on this call in person, perhaps, as well as more. Yeah, and also hear that Boston is is quite all right in june so oh it's so nice in june manfred <laughs> it's one of the nicest weather patterns out there it's the reason you don't live in boston is the winter is terrible but the summer perfect 
All right. If I go back there, I'm going to have to get that ice cream place again that I found last time. <laughs> it's going to be the right way to for it, I hope. I, I've lived in Boston for a little while. So if anyone needs any local recommendations, I can also, I can hook you up. Well, you're um, gonna be there, so you're gonna you can drag us around. <laughs> yeah, <gonna> be... <laughs> uh, we've got more Trino community broadcast episodes in the works, Manfred. Yeah, um, if you go and I should, can do that here in the upcoming episode. So next time on the fourth of April, Istvan is joining us from Mitsu, uh, which is a no-code uh, analytics tool for that has Trino support, and it looks really really cool and has some very interesting ideas in it. Uh, should be really interesting to talk to Istvan. He has got really good experience across the analytics space. So um, with some very novel ideas, that's going to be a, a great episode. And then on the 24th of April, I'm very proud to have pulled in Java champion and all around geek and well-known uh, Java hacker, Lucas Eda from uh, Data Geekery, whose project called Juke is uh, enabling you to basically write Java code to so you don't have to worry about the SQL underlying stuff, and this now works with True Trino as well. So, um, building like type safe Java code to query a database can be also interesting. And obviously, because Trino is different <laughs> because it has support for all these different data sources, there's going to be some interesting discussions on what what pains that post for Juke and like how this works with different catalogs and stuff. And obviously, Lucas is also um, very very well versed in Java. And so any geek that has some questions for him, like Jan probably has some again, <laughs> jump into the live call and, and help us grill uh, Lucas. So it's going to be super interesting. Well, I think that's it from us. Um, of course, the Trino Definitive Guide now in more languages than ever. And uh, aside from that, I think we'll see you next time. Thank you all for tuning in, whether live or, you know, the 99% of you that tune in after the fact on YouTube. We appreciate your viewership and uh, we'll see you again soon.